All right, today we're going to be talking about population and urbanization. Let me just pull up the PowerPoint for that. Okay, let's go over our learning objectives. We're only gonna do half of this chapter again today. I find it's easier for me to do them in chunks. So we'll do them by halves probably from here forward. Uh, maybe not, I haven't decided yet for sure. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna contrast the views of new Malthusians and anti-Malthusians on population growth and the food supply. We'll explain why uh, people are starving. And then we'll also explain why the least industrialized nations have so many children, the consequences of such rapid population growth, uh, population pyramids, three demographic variables, and problems in forecasting population growth. And then that's pretty much where we'll stop. Um, we'll just talk about an introduction to cities and then um, that's it. Next time we'll go over how uh, cities developed and uh, we'll look at the urbanization from city to mega region next uh, lecture. We'll also familiarize ourselves with the patterns of urbanization that characterize the US compare the models of urban growth, discuss alienation in communities, types of people who live in the city, the norm of non-involvement and the diffusion of responsibility. And then we'll explain the effects of suburbanization, disinvestment and deindustrialization and the potential of urban revitalization. But those will be uh, next lecture, as I said. So, all right, we're gonna talk about who the new Malthusians are versus anti-Malthusians. Uh, which one is correct and why are people starving? So basically, if you look at uh, who the new Malthusians are, they uh, are people who are essentially fearful of population growth and it getting out of control. So according to them, basically, uh, Spanish conquistadores uh, brought back the potato to Europe and uh, that became the main food of the lower classes with this greater food abundance. Uh, the death rate dropped a lot and then uh, the population began to explode in Europe. This was all occurring during the 1700s. And Thomas Malthus, where the name New Malthusian and Anti-Malthusian comes from, he was an English economist. He saw this population growth as a sign of a big problem and he proposed the Malthus theorem which said that although populations grow geometrically, basically from two to four to eight to 16 and so on, uh, food supply increases only arithmetically from one, two, three, and four, and so on. This means that if births go unchecked, uh, the population is gonna outgrow the food supply. So basically you have a situation where food is uh, growing almost linearly, whereas uh, population is growing exponentially. And that's a, it's a huge problem. Okay, so new Malthusians are convinced that uh, the situation is pretty bad, uh, if not worse than uh, what Malthus ever would have imagined. So for example, uh, in the time that it takes you to read this chapter, about 20 to 40,000 babies will be born. And then by this time tomorrow, 246,000 more people will be on this earth. So every day there are 246,000 more people on this earth, you have people being born and people dying, but there's a, an additional 246,000 people every day. And we can see that from uh, this figure here. Basically, we see that uh, each day you have about 403,000 people being born, 157,000 people dying for a net total uh, population increase of 246,000 people. Then uh, every second you have a net increase of about 2.85 people. Every minute you have 171 new people. Every hour, 10,250. Each day, as we said, 246,000. Each week, 1,722,000 and so on. Each year you get about 90 million additional people. <clears throat> Oops. So this slide just basically explains what we've already been talking about. What's next? This illustrates the uh, expo exponential growth rate of uh, the population, right? So 
basically exponential growth means that um, numbers double during approximately equal intervals. This shows a steep acceleration at the end. So every, now it's like every, I don't know how often it's doubling per se, but every 12 years, we're adding an additional billion people on this earth. But you can see roughly every equal interval along the X axis, there's a doubling along the Y axis and see how quickly it accelerates. <clears throat> So um, just a couple interesting statistics illustrating this idea. You can see here that from the beginning of time all the way back here, which is not illustrated, this is just the birth of Christ. From the beginning of time all the way up to 1800, you didn't even have 1 billion people on this earth. When Christ was born, there was about 300 million people on this earth. Uh, today we have like 7.6 or 7.7 .7 billion. Um, that's not exact, but it's definitely over 7.5. Uh, a billion people. You can check uh, census.gov and they'll tell you an up-to-date amount of people on this earth and in the United States. Uh, let's see. Okay, so the, uh, the second billion of people put on this earth only took 130 years. So from 1800 to 1930, you had uh, uh, another billion people put on this earth. And then just 30 years later, in 1960, you had another billion, you have 3 billion. Then in 1975, just 15 years later, you have 4 billion. 1987, 12 years later, you have 5 billion. In 1999, you have 6 billion. In 2011, you have 7 billion. Okay, so as I said, each year or each day, rather, uh, you get 246,000 more people on this earth. Each year, you get about 90 million people more on this earth. Uh, during the next four years, we'll add more people than the uh, to the world than there are in the entire United States. Uh, in the next dozen years, we'll add as many people. Uh, we'll add another billion, basically, is what the book says. <clears throat> so this terrifies anti-Malthusians. Uh, this is uh, a graph representative of the uh, demographic transition. So this is what anti-Malthusians think will take place. So instead of this giant population explosion, they think the population is actually going to decrease. Uh, basically how to read this is the first stage of population growth. Um, you roughly have the same amount of births and deaths. So the population remains stable. But stage two, you see deaths go down but births remain stable, so there's a big population increase. And then in the third uh, stage, you see births go down to kind of uh, meet the uh, deaths going down. And then in the fourth stage, you actually see more uh, deaths than births, so you see a, a population decrease. So during most of its history, Europe was in stage one. The population was about the same year to year. Then came stage two, which was the population explosion that Malthus talked about. Then came uh, stage three, which brought uh, births into line with deaths. And uh, anti-Malthusians say that uh, this will also happen in least industrialized nations. Um, current stage in population growth is uh, stage two in least industrialized nations because uh, hybrid seeds and medicine from most industrialized nations and pure public drinking water, their death rates have gone down while their birth rates have remained high. So once they move into uh, stage three, things will kind of uh, even out. This is just a picture of a large family that was characteristic of the US. Uh, back in 1887, people had these big families. Now the average person only has about 2.1 children um, in the US. So families have shrunk with industrialization and that's kind of characteristic all across the world. As nations industrialize, uh, family sizes decrease. So the question is, will uh, the uh, least industrialized nations enter stage three of the demographic transition? Um, after World War II, the West exported its hybrid seeds, its herbicides, techniques of public hygiene, Death rates plummeted and uh, their food supply increased and their health improved, but uh, birth rates stayed the same. 
So some predicted catastrophe, um, but we can use a conflict perspective to understand what happened during this. And we, we uh, see that the exploding populations of least industrialized nations were a threat to the global balance of power. And uh, more industrialized nations viewed them, this population explosion as a threat to uh, these more industrialized nations. And then leaders kind of used the United Nations as a tool to help reduce the, their population growth. And uh, we see now that the annual growth of least industrialized nations has actually started to drop off. It's dropped by about 44%. So you already see them entering stage three of the uh, demographic transition. So which theory is correct? Anti-Malthusians predict population shrinkage. Um, new Malthusians predict the population explosion. Uh, it's probably just too early to tell who's correct. We don't really know for sure. So why are people starving? This is a uh, line graph looking at uh, food production. It's actually increased. The amount of food per person has increased uh, since 1950. There's more food per each person now than there was back in 1950. And this is with the population like roughly doubling since then. So we see this is a big food explosion. So that bodes well for what uh, anti-Malthusians are saying. But then why isn't there enough food for starving people in uh, countries, like poorer countries? Is it because it's not because there isn't enough food in the world, it's because the food isn't reaching them. Let me see what the next slide is real quick. Yeah, so you see the picture of this starving child in Sudan. So why isn't he getting the food he needs? Uh, we can conclude that people don't starve because the earth produces too little food. Um, rather, it's from droughts and wars. These are the main reasons that people don't get food. Droughts slow or stop uh, food production, and so does the war. So does the war. Uh, in a civil war, for example, uh, the different sides will burn crops and farmers will uh, end up running away to the city. So new Malthusians though still aren't convinced. They often will say that the uh, population is still growing and we need to, we don't know how long earth can uh, keep producing all of this food, right? So that it could, uh, it can end at some point. This is a picture of people in industrialized nations uh, having a food eating contest. So very different lifestyle compared to that of Sudan. So it, just as a side note, we know that um, the problems of people starving in Africa is not because there are too many people per se, because there are 37 people per square kilometer in Africa but there are 136 people per square kilometer in Asia. And Asia doesn't have the same food problems as Africa. Africa has uh, a lot of fertile land that hasn't even been farmed yet. The main reasons for famines in Africa cannot be because of, uh, because of uh, having too many people, because there are more people in Asia and they don't experience the same issues. Uh, there's an interesting uh, down-to-earth sociology section on page 602 of your book. It looks at um, genetically modified foods. Uh, it's worth noting. So basically, uh, as scientists have experimented, they've developed seeds that have uh, increased the uh, harvests. They develop seeds that uh, can withstand drought and that uh, can actually produce uh, insecticides within the, own, within the plant which is interesting. Uh, but uh, these uh, new seeds have been researched and uh, some Italian researchers divided rats into control and experimental groups. They fed the control group non-genetically modified corn and then they gave the experimental group genetically modified corn. And uh, they found that those who ate the genetically modified corn uh, came down with tumors more often. They had some tumors that were large enough to block the uh, rats breathing and digestion. Uh, the rats' kidneys and livers were also damaged. Sex hormones were disturbed. 
and so on. Uh, the researchers suggested that the GMO corns disturb the subnuclear structure of uh, the body cells. So there was criticisms from Monsanto, who produces these uh, gen the genetically modified corn. They said that there were not enough rats in the study. They were using the wrong rats. The statistics were flawed, and so on. There was a lot of pressure, and then the uh, the scientific journal that uh, published the article actually caved in from this pressure from Monsanto and then they rescinded the article. They took it back. Uh, some demanded that uh, Monsanto publish the results of their own research, but they never did. And then it was later revealed that the uh, journal that took back the research developed a, a new position, which is called the Associate Editor for Biotechnology. And this position was filled by a member who used to work for Monsanto and uh, it's possible that this person influenced the academic journal to take back the article. Okay, nevertheless, let's move on. Population growth. <clears throat> why uh, have the least industrialized nations, why do least industrialized nations have so many children? So why are, are these women having so many kids? What are the consequences of this rapid population growth? Uh, what are population pyramids and how are they used to understand? What are the three demographic variables? And then what are problems in forecasting population growth? So you can see here the least industrialized nations, the population is exploding much more rapidly than in uh, most industrialized nations. So what are some of the reasons for that? There are three mentioned in your book. So why are, why are uh, uh, least industrialized nations having so many children? So basically you have to understand the world from their perspective to understand that first, um, parenthood is a highly uh, regarded status in least industrialized nations. In rural areas of these uh, countries, motherhood is the most prized status a woman can achieve. The more children she has, uh, the more she is thought to achieve her purpose in life. Similar, similarly, a man proves his manhood by fathering children, uh, especially sons, because his name lives on. Uh, second, in these types of societies, children are viewed as being a sign of God's blessing. And uh, third, uh, children contribute to the family income at a young age, and you can see that here. Uh, at like about eight years old, kids start caring for chickens and ducks. Also at eight, they start caring for younger children fetching water when they get closer to nine and so on down the list. They perform more and more economic functions, so they're useful. Um, in least industrialized nations, the government doesn't provide benefits like social security or unemployment. So the more children you have, the more security you have. They can lend you, they can give you money. They can um, do work when you're sick or when you're too old to work. So uh, the book talks about a man in India who says that uh, he said that he was try people tried to convince him that he shouldn't have so many children. He has eight children. He says, now, now you see, I have six sons and two daughters and I sit in home and leisure. They are grown up and they bring me money because of my large family. I'm a rich man. So basically they're an economic asset. So what are the consequences of rapid population growth? Um, the number of available, essentially, if your population doubles, the number of available jobs and housing has to double. Food production has to double, transportation, communication facilities has to double, water, gas, sewer, electrical systems, schools, hospitals, churches, civic buildings, theaters, stores, and parks must also double if your population doubles. So that's a huge burden on a society. So population growth can have uh, <laughs> big ramifications. And if, if you don't keep up, you're going to have a lower standard of living. Uh, applying the conflict perspective, conflict theorists point out that uh, declining standards of living poses a threat to political instability. Uh, basically, there could be protests and riots and revolution if there's a declining standard of living. Uh, fearing such disruptions, most industrialized nations use uh, the United Nations to control births. And uh, basically, they give agricultural aid and condoms and IUDs to least industrialized nations to do that. They also sell them weapons to help keep the populations under control. 
population pyramids is a tool for understanding. These are population pyramids, what they look like. Uh, to illustrate um, reasons for populations changing, you can look at these uh, population pyramids. They basically are figures that depict a country's population by age and sex. So basically you, hear, you see here that um, the United States has fewer men and women at the younger ages than say Mexico, or I'm sorry, than say the world. No, is this Mexico? No, this is Mexico, my, my fault. And the world too. So we have most of our population in the middle age range and they have, uh, the world has most of its population at the younger ages. So the book says to imagine overnight that uh, the average number of uh, children had by Mexicans drops to the same that uh, the United States has. You would still see Mexico having many more children, even if they only had 1.9 children, just like uh, the United States has. They would have many more because you have more people within age-bearing ages having these children as compared to the United States. So it will take a lot more to get uh, Mexico's population under control than just having fewer births because there are already so many people uh, within age bearing, ra bearing range. Okay, the three demographic variables. So basically, how do you predict how many people are gonna live in the United States 50 years from now? You need to know that because educators need to know how many schools to build. Uh, corporations need to anticipate changes in the market. The government needs to know how many uh, specialized positions to train for, and we need to know how much taxes we're going to get. So it's, it, there are a lot of issues surrounding uh, population growth that need to be figured out. So we can use the three demographic variables to figure out population growth. Uh, fertility is one of them. Um, mortality is the other one, and migration is the third. So fertility rate refers to uh, the average amount of children that women have and the world's overall fertility rate is about 2.5. So during a woman's lifetime, the average woman is gonna have two and a half children. Fecundity is different than fertility. Fecundity, fecundity is the number of children that women are capable of having. So there have been some women who have given, up to, given birth up to 30 people. So we can see here that Romania, Singapore, South Korea, and Taiwan have the lowest birth rates in the world. Meanwhile, Niger, South Sudan, Congo, and Chad have the highest birth rates. So in Niger, they have about seven and a half kids on average. Uh, in Romania, you have about one and a half, or 1.2 kids on average. Uh, you can also look at the mortality rate, which is uh, basically just how many people die essentially. Uh, you can look at the crude death rate, which is the annual number of deaths per thousand people. Compare this to the crude birth rate, which is the annual number of births per thousand people. And then you can look at migration too. So we're trying to figure out where the population is going to be 50 years from now. We're looking at births, we're looking at deaths, and we're looking at migration. So migration is the movement of people from one area to another. There are two types of migration. One of those types is when people move from one region of a country to another region of the country. So for example, a lot of people are moving to the South these days from uh, the Northeast and the Midwest, and they're also moving to the Southwest. And then uh, you can also look at uh, the Great Migration, which is where a lot of black people during World War II and after World War II moved to the North for jobs, and now they're moving back to the South, as I said. Uh, the second type of migration occurs when people move from one country to another. And this affects the uh, net migration rate, which is the difference between the number of immigrants and emigrants per 1,000 population. So you have people moving into the country, which are immigrants, and you have emigrants, which are people moving out of the country. And then you basically subtract the two to see uh, the net migration rate. Uh, there are different motivations for migrating. One of them is uh, well, you have pushes and pulls, essentially. The pushes are people wanting to escape from their country of origin. They want to escape poverty, violence, or war, or persecution of religious and political ideals. The pulls are the things that draw them to a new land, like opportunities for education and jobs and whatnot. Uh, the direction of migration, there's a 
flow of migration typically from uh, least industrialized nations to most industrialized nations, not usually the other way around. The United States is the number one choice for immigrants. The U.S. emits more immigrants each year than all the other nations of the world combined. So one out of every eight people in the U.S. was born in another country. Table 20.2 in your book shows where these people are coming from. This is that table. Most are coming from Asia. India and China specifically have the uh, most, most have the highest uh, immigrant rates from Asia, but Asia overall is the uh, area that most people are coming from. Mexico uh, is, is higher than India and China, but that's in North America. There are fewer people coming from North America than Asia, but there are more people coming from Mexico than any other country. Europe comes in third, Africa, and then South America. These are illegal immigrants. Those were legal ones, which we just looked at. These are illegal immigrants here. You can see that most illegal immigrants are coming from Mexico. So experts can't really agree on whether immigrants are good for the economy or whether they're bad for it. We don't know. So uh, if you look at what immigrants produce in jobs and taxes, uh, that's a good thing for the economy, but you can also see that they cost money and welfare and uh, our medical and school systems. So first conclusion, according to your author uh, of the book, seems to be that the more educated immigrants produce more than they cost, while the less educated cost more than they produce. So <clears throat> basically, we can uh, pre predict what the population is going to look like in, uh, in a number of years from now by, uh, by taking the amount of births, subtracting the amount of deaths, and then looking at migration, the three uh, demographic variables that we just talked about. But uh, there are some caveats to that. And uh, one of those would be that politicians often try to influence um, population growth. So some, this is an example of Italy doing that. Some, uh, in Italy, they had uh, commercials showing a man holding a half burned cigarette and the words, don't let your sperm go up and smoke. They also uh, had another advertisement uh, showing a woman holding an hourglass with the words, beauty has no age limits, but for fertility does. So they were trying to get people to have uh, babies. Um, Italians were kind of offended by these and then the government pulled the advertisements, but uh, other countries have been successful. So for example, Hitler, uh, Hitler outlawed abortions and offered cash to women to give birth and it, it succeeded. Uh, in Turkey today, politicians pin a gold medal on a woman who gave birth to their first child. Uh, they also give cash to women having children. China did the opposite and they tried, they uh, were successful in uh, decreasing the amount of children that people had. They had, used to have the one couple, one child policy. So if a woman became pregnant without government permission, doctors would abort the fetus, even if, it was, if she was nine months pregnant. After her first child, each woman uh, had an IUD, and every three months she had to have a sonogram to verify that she wasn't pregnant. If she had a second child, she was sterilized. Uh, this reduced the amount of children born in uh, China by about 400 million. The result is a shortage of young people entering the workforce, and uh, it kind of threatens their economic expansion. So they shifted their policy, and now they allow uh, two children. So it's not just politicians affecting uh, the outcomes of population growth. You, al you also have things like wars, e economic booms, economic busts, plagues, and famines. These all also affect population growth. So yeah, going back to China real quickly um, and India, you see how many missing girls are there in the world? There are over 100 million missing girls for every uh, 100 births of girls, there are about 105 boys born in China. For every 100 baby girls, there are 121 baby boys. So China has about 30 million fewer females than uh, young males at about age 20. So what happened to all these girls, female infanticide is the reason for it. And we see that uh, yeah, it, was, it, was popular, it was common 
years ago in China for when a woman went into labor for the uh, the midwife to sometimes uh, grab a bucket of water and then plunge the baby girl into the water before it can take its first first breath. Um, Also, uh, there was sex selection abortion, which uh, basically aborted any female babies. At the root of all this is uh, economics. When parents can't work, they expect their sons to support them. But when a daughter is grown, uh, she's not going to support the parents. She's going to show obligation to her husband's family. So now you basically see uh, in China, there are six bachelors for every five potential brides. So politicians are fearing that men can't, who can't marry will become alienated from society and create problems. So uh, they've, once again, I said they've uh, taken the emphasis off of uh, one child and uh, having male children. And here you see a uh, photo of Chinese parents with their uh, female child trying to uh, increase the amount of children, that, uh, or female children in Chinese society. So basically, um, there's a projection of US population growth in the future. It just really depends on a bunch of factors which we've already kind of talked about. You know, how many, how many women will go to college? That's gonna affect uh, the population growth. How many immigrants will we have? That's gonna affect the population growth. There are a ton of unknowns and that's why we have different predictions. Okay, next we're going to talk about cities. That'll be next time. Uh, That's it for tonight. And I will upload the uh, second half of Chapter 20 later. I hope you enjoyed it. Take care of yourselves.